Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Teen Kids News. I'm Reed. We've got a lot to tell you about, so let's get started. Here's our top story. They are the biggest awards in music, the Grammys. And never in the history of the prestigious competition has a youth orchestra ever won one of those coveted gold statuettes. Until recently. That's correct. Move aside, Beyonce and Harry Styles. The New York Youth Symphony has earned a Grammy, and they did it, despite the difficulties of recording during the COVID pandemic. Here's an excerpt from their album titled Works by Florence Price, Jesse Montgomery, Valerie Coleman. Impressive as the performance is, it's even more impressive when you hear just how they did it. Joining us are one of the orchestra's musicians, Noelia Carrasco and conductor Michael Repper. Welcome, both of you. Thank you so much for having us. Noelia, describe the feeling when you had heard your orchestra won a Grammy. When I heard about the Grammy, it was complete amazement, shock, pride, so many emotions. We were all together in the room. Grammy goes to Works by Florence. <laughs> Um, and I think we were just feeding off of each other's energy, and it was, it was really an incredible moment. That's wonderful. Michael, although you're not a teen, you are one of the youngest conductors to ever win a Grammy. So congratulations on that. Oh, thank you so much. It's thrilling. Before talking about the album, first tell us about the New York Youth Symphony. Well, the New York Youth Symphony is one of the most special groups of young people anywhere. And what makes it the most special thing is that it's a group of young people that comes together through a shared passion, and that is music. Of course, the skill level of the young musicians is incredibly high, and uh, I was so happy that everybody rallied around this really great uh, project during the pandemic. Let's talk about that. The orchestra had planned to perform live at the world-famous Carnegie Hall, but that had to be canceled because of COVID. So you came up with a plan B. Yeah, that's essentially right. Of course, like all orchestras uh, worldwide, uh, COVID prevented performing uh, in the years 2020 and 2021 due to safety. And so I came up with the idea of recording an album and we had to devise a pretty crazy way of making it happen because we couldn't fit the entire orchestra in a room together. So we had to engineer a way of doing it separately and in small groups that was very different from the way that one would ordinarily record an orchestra album. Noelia, as a cellist, you were in the group with just the string musicians. Was it strange performing without all the other instruments? It was definitely a really interesting experience not knowing what the other parts sounded like, especially since many of the pieces that we were performing don't have recordings uh, that were already made. And let me just add to that. This, any member of the orchestra who was playing a string instrument, like Noelia, actually didn't have any idea what the full piece sounded like with the woodwinds and brass because they recorded first. So they didn't know what it sounded like until the album was released. And it was a very, very unique and weird experience. Noelia, speaking of experiences, what was the most challenging part of performing under those conditions? We had to prepare our parts before going in to record. And I think that was maybe one of the first times I really made sure that every single note and rhythm and stylistic uh, choice was very precise. And Mike helped us with all the decision, decision making and preparation. And so that when we got into the recording process, everything could happen and in a very uh, smooth manner. And I think we were able to actually get through the recording pretty swiftly, which was a surprise on all of our parts um, because usually these kinds of things take hours and hours on end. Michael, the pieces chosen for the album are all part of a theme. Yeah, that's right. We're extremely proud that all of the pieces on this album are works by Black women. And Black women have been historically neglected by our field. Uh, mostly they're pieces that hadn't been recorded before, so it, it's, it's very, very special. That's a great tribute. Noelia, 
What has being in the orchestra meant to you? To me, it has definitely given me so many opportunities, especially as a young person in this music industry. And I think it's just such a, an amazing experience that I really hope that many more young uh, musicians are able to experience as well. Michael, winning the Grammy for Best Orchestral Recording wasn't a walk in the park. You were up against some pretty stiff competition, weren't you? Uh, yes, we were, thr I mean, still shocked, honestly. Um, and we were, uh, you know, in a category with the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the Berlin Philharmonic, people that you'll know, like John Williams, who wrote Harry Potter and Jurassic Park. I mean, these are real, real names. And the album also snagged the top spot on the Billboard chart. Congratulations to you and all of the other members of the New York Youth Symphony. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. Originally, the Grammys were going to be called the Eddies, named after Thomas Edison, the man famous for inventing the modern light bulb. Let me explain. Long before Spotify and YouTube, there were record players. And long before those, there were phonograph machines that played wax cylinders. And those were invented by Edison. However, the Recording Academy decided to ask the public to suggest a name for the award. And the winner was... Emil Berliner. His invention was the flat disc called the gramophone record. From gramophone came the world's best known music award, the Grammy. For Teen Kids News, I'm Ava. We still have a lot more to tell you about. Teen Kids News will be right back. In this episode of Emily's special series, A Bit of Belgium, we visit a city that played a vital role in America's early history. The stunning city of Ghent is the third largest city in Belgium, and possibly the most beautiful. Before I tell you about America's particular connection with Ghent, let me first give you a quick tour of some of the city's highlights. Ghent is a port city, and for a while it was one of the most important trading centers in Europe. Because of its early wealth, Ghent was able to pour lots of money into constructing miles of canals, graceful arch bridges, incredibly ornate buildings, and richly decked out churches. The skyline is dominated by towers and steeples. The tallest is a bell tower that has withstood wars, plagues, and weather for almost a thousand years. Soaring upwards almost 300 feet, it's the tallest bell tower in Belgium. The large building next to the tower was home base for the all-important cloth trade during the Middle Ages. But then, Ghent and its cloth trade began to decline. It took an 18th century hacker to restore Ghent's prosperity. His name was Levin Bowens. When he was a boy, he had been sent to live in England and to learn their secrets for making textiles. He did exactly that, sneaking machine drawings out of England. Back home in Ghent, Levin set up the continent's first mechanical weaving machines. This is video of a later version of the machine he built. But it gives you an idea of just how complicated these machines were. Operated by a steam engine, they were able to make thread faster, stronger, and less expensively than thread made by hand. And it helped to catapult Ghent and Belgium to the top of the textile trade. A popular pastime is to sit outside a cafe and take in the surroundings. This is one of the city's oldest family-run businesses. They make one of the specialties of Ghent, 
mustard. Yeah, so this is our big barrel full of mustard, and it's the mustard that we make here in the basement of the building. Eh? So uh, it's a really dark, it's a really spicy mustard. And as you can see, I've got a little pump here, and I can pump it straight from the barrel where we make it downstairs, here in the barrel upstairs. And then we fill all the jars by hand. So usually we take a jar like this, and then we fill all the jars by hand. And we've been doing that for more than 200 years now. This cart is filled with a colorful local candy called Kuberdon. Inside the hard outer shell is gooey filling, originally raspberry, but now there are many flavor options. Ghent also has a castle, but there's so much to show and tell about the castle that we're going to do that in an upcoming episode. And that leaves us where we started, with the story of America's connection to Ghent. The story starts with the War of 1812. The young United States had been battling the British for more than two years. And things weren't going well for the Americans. Not only was Washington, D.C. set on fire, the president's home, the executive mansion, was torched. Here's a piece of historic trivia. When repairs were finally made to cover the dark burn marks, the building was repainted in fresh white paint. And that's why today we call it the White House. Back to our story. It was in this building that American and British negotiators hammered out an agreement to end the war. Led by soon-to-be president John Quincy Adams, the negotiations had dragged on for four months. Finally, on Christmas Eve, 1814, the Treaty of Ghent was signed. But because word of the treaty had to travel across the Atlantic Ocean, it took seven weeks before anyone in America learned of it. It's one of history's ironies that the Battle of New Orleans was fought two weeks after the agreement was reached. That battle was one of the most lopsided and quickest victories in American history. Though outnumbered by the British, the Americans, led by Andrew Jackson, won in just 30 minutes. The British had 2,000 casualties, including the death of their commanding general. The Americans suffered only 71 casualties. Of course, if they had cell phones back then, the Battle of New Orleans would never have happened. Just goes to show how important good communication is. With a bit of Belgium, I'm Emily for Teen Kids News. We've got to take a short break, and then we'll be back with more Teen Kids News. Ben Franklin was very lucky when he did his famous experiment, proving that lightning was a form of electricity, he could have easily been killed. That he wasn't shows that the story that his kite was hit by lightning probably isn't true. To be clear, few doubt that he flew a kite in a storm, but experts say his kite encountered what's called an ambient electrical charge, a sort of building up of electricity in the sky but not an actual lightning bolt. To give you an idea of how deadly lightning is, it's hotter than the surface of the sun, five times hotter. It's no exaggeration that in just a flash, we could have lost one of our country's greatest minds, not to mention one of our most invaluable founding fathers. Did I say that Franklin was lucky that he wasn't struck by lightning? I should have said all of us Americans are lucky he wasn't. For Teen Kids News, I'm Ava. Driving, it's not just a privilege, it's a responsibility. And to help you to drive responsibly, the National Road Safety Foundation produced this video. I use my superpowers to make the roads safer for everyone. Uh-oh, that car's getting too close to the cyclist. A puff of super breath will move the car over. Drivers, remember, bikes and scooters have the right to be on the road. Hmm. No sidewalks here. Without super eyesight, others may not see her. You should wear bright colors and reflective material. Thanks. Take my super advice. Share the road. Don't miss the other cool videos created by the NRSF. It's easy to find more. Simply like, follow, and subscribe to the National Road Safety Foundation. We'll be right back with more Teen Kids news right after this.
Do you have a credit card? If you do, you're not alone. 20% of all teens under 17 have one, though it's probably in their parents' name. To have a card in your own name, you need to be at least 18. Credit cards have lots of advantages. For example, you don't need to carry around a lot of cash. The monthly statements help you keep track of what you're spending. But what happens if you lose your credit card? Joining us again is Whitman Ochii, host of the podcast Money Ed. Do we have to worry that if we lose our card and someone finds it, that we'll be responsible for whatever they buy? Well, as soon as you realize you've lost your credit card, you need to report it to the credit card company immediately. Once you do that, you're not responsible for any charges made to that card. Okay, we're not responsible for charges made after we reported the lost card. But what about charges someone makes to my card before I get the chance to contact the company? Fortunately, the federal government has rules to protect us. If someone finds your card and racks up thousands of dollars of charges, the most you'll be responsible for is $50. $50? That's still a lot of babysitting I'd have to do. But clearly better than owing thousands. Thanks, Whitman. It's great to be here. With Money Smarts 101, I'm Sebastian. It's time for a quick commercial break, but we'll be right back with more Teen Kids News, so don't go away. Are you on the fence about whether or not to go to college? Here's one more factor to consider. Happiness. According to the experts, the more education you have, the greater the chance of being happy. Researchers found that when asked if they're happy, 89% of those who have a high school diploma said yes. When college grads were asked that same question, 94% said yes. Granted, a five-point spread isn't a huge number, but in these days where we always seem to be facing some major problem, like global warming, I'll take any points on the happiness scale I can get. For Teen Kids News, I'm Brendan. This report is brought to you by Paramount Pictures. Hey, guys, if we weren't monsters that were shunned by society and we could do what we wanted, what would you guys do? Go to high school. Maybe get a girlfriend. Or better yet, take on a whole new army of super bad guys in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. Now available to buy or rent on digital. Police are baffled by the recent crime wave led by a super fly. Nobody's ever seen his face. Why? Because he kills everyone who does. Cool. No, not cool. Eh, A bit cool. Can I kick it? We take out super fun, and then everyone will think we're cool. They'll accept us. Good plan, but it's not going to be as easy as it sounds. Y'all some little tortoises, huh? I can't believe there are other mutants. You want to roll with us? (laughs) Humans are never going to like us. So we're going to let the mutants rule the earth. People's they got to go. OK, um, sort of a twist. This is insane. Turtle, mutant, karate teens. I want to know everything about you. One thing to know is that this is the first time the Teenage Turtles are voiced by actual teen actors. It was always so fundamental to making a thing about teenagers was to cast actual teenagers. We're the first teenagers to play these roles. Hey, I'm Michelangelo. Perfecto. I remember hearing his voice and just being like, oh, that's like a perfect version of that. Okay, Batman. Dude, what? (laughs) I'm just trying to hype you guys up. Nick did like a perfect balance of being like not too naggy. Guard the exits. We're going to need the most foolproof plan. Every single ninja technique. I need you guys to use stealth to block the doors. Did you say going loud? Wait, what? I'm awesome. Brady Noon is Raphael in the film. I dream about fighting every night. You got a rage problem, oh, right? It's not a problem. But all I've got is a big stick. He thought he was just incredible. He just has an incredibly specific voice. How they got all those voices to fit together so perfectly is just part of more than 40 minutes of exciting bonus material. Other voiceover movies usually just film by yourself in a room with the director and the producers. But in this one, they made sure that all four turtles were filming together. <gasps> like, let's have four people at once talking over each other. You're awesome! We vibe with each other! 
That's, that's a great step. And if you've ever wanted to try your hand at drawing, grab your pencil. Now let's draw the top of his bandana, and we're gonna start here. We're gonna come up just a little ways. My son, Michael Angelo, you have heart. Donatello, you have wisdom. Raphael, you have bravery. And Leonardo, honor. But will that be enough to stop Superfly and his gang? Find out in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem, available to buy or rent on digital. I'm Mason for Teen Kids News. Well, that wraps up our show for this week. But we'll be back with more Teen Kids News next week. See you then.